So thanks for, for, for attending. Hopefully this will be a shorter webcast than some of the historical ones we've done in the past. Uh, the, the AV Foundation framework is still relatively new. Uh, it was introduced uh, in the iPhone 2.2 uh, SDK. And it, it looks by, by all indications that, that they're not quite finished with it yet. It's, um, it's called the AV Foundation framework, uh, which suggests that it will at some point do video. Uh, right now, the only real working APIs uh, for it are for sound. Uh, so I'm expecting this framework to get much better over time. We, uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to, um, <clears throat> to document the AV Foundation framework in, uh, in the iPhone SDK development book. So uh, if you're interested in, in getting uh, some information uh, about how it works, uh, as well as some of the other sound frameworks, you can pick up a copy of that. I've also got a, uh, an excerpt from the book uh, specifically covering this framework on my website. And so when, when we're done here, if you'd like to download the, uh, the demonstration, there's some, some Xcode uh, examples uh, up as well. Uh, you can steer over to jarski.com and, uh, and find the, uh, the AV Foundation uh, framework off of my, my blog page. So, um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, this is a pretty new framework. And um, there, are, there are three main uh, techniques to play sound on the iPhone. Uh, as of as of the introduction of this framework, uh, and I'll give you a quick rundown of the difference between the three. The, the most commonly uh, used one for playing just generic sounds is is the system sounds uh, function uh, in in the system, and and essentially that piece is sort of only good for playing yeah, a pre-recorded sound file. You have to register it. You don't really get any control over mixing or anything like that. It's just essentially for, you know, you've got a, an instant messenger application that needs to play a ding, and you can use that to, um, to make sound. Uh, it's very, very simple, very primitive. Uh, you can also use it to vibrate the phone. It uh, doesn't really give you any, uh, you know, any real granularity in terms of being able to mix the sound, adjust the volume, uh, where you're playing it back and whatnot. Um, so that's, if you're writing a simple application, that may be enough for you. Uh, the, the second, in, in, increasing in complexity, the, the second more complex framework is this AV Foundation framework. And that's sort of built upon your, your basic system sounds in that you could not only play these pre-recorded sound files, but you could play more than one of them at a time. Uh, and you can adjust the volume of each. Uh, you can uh, set where in the sound you want to actually play from. Uh, it gives you a little bit more functionality. It's, it's useful for, for games, uh, you know, for uh, any kind of like a, a drum uh, machine application, anything that needs to play multiple sounds uh, simultaneously. Uh, so they, and that's what we're going to explore today. And then the, the most complex framework, uh, which we're not covering today, would be the, the audio toolbox framework. And uh, this framework is also available on the desktop. Uh, essentially, this is what you would need for playing digital sound. So if you've got a video game that creates its own sound, uh, you know, out of raw bits, an actual sound stream, uh, or, or if you're going to <clears throat> be recording in real time, say you were writing a voice synthesizer or something to that effect, the audio toolbox framework is essentially what allows you to deal with sound on a, on a bit by bit level. Uh, all three of these are covered in the SDK book. The one we're going to cover today is, of course, the AV Foundation. And uh, you know, as I said, it's kind of a good go-between uh, for, for the other frameworks. So <clears throat> we'll get started here. I'll, I'll uh, share out my screen. and. Um, I've got some prepared uh, content. You probably don't want to sit there and watch me type stuff in. And chances are I'd, I'd make a lot of mistakes typing, too. So uh, to keep this under an hour, uh, I've got a couple of sample projects here. But before we get going, I'll show you how to use the, the uh, framework in a new project. Uh, I'm going to start up Xcode here. <coughs> and then this should take a minute because I'm running last year's MacBook. Uh, so I'm going to go to new project, uh, create just some sample new project, I'll call it example. And this is what most people do to just create sort of a blank skeleton for, for your iPhone uh, application. Uh, so, so right now we're ready, you know, we've got a, a project, we could compile it, it would do nothing. To take advantage of the AV Foundation framework, you're going to need to do two things. Um, first of all, you want to make sure that you're running the 2.2 SDK. And if you go to the project menu, and set active SDK. You can see right here that the simulator for 2.2 is the default. Uh, the, the big difference, essentially, is if you were to compile this for 
let's say the 2.0 SDK, when you sold your application in the App Store, anyone running 2.0 and 2.1 would be able to buy it and download it. Um, it. By using the AV Foundation framework, you're essentially locking your users into having to upgrade to 2.2 uh, before they're going to be able to use your app. So you're going to go here, set active SDK, and then for now you could do simulator iPhone OS 2.2. When you get ready to actually distribute your application in the App Store, you go to device. But just make sure that 2.2 is selected. Otherwise, you're going to end up uh, with an application that, that just essentially will give you uh, a 1,000 errors when you try to build it. Um, so from there, you've got that set up. The next thing to do is to simply add uh, the AV Foundation framework to the project. And if you control click on frameworks, and go to add, and then existing frameworks, it pops up a list of uh, all the sanctioned frameworks that, that are available uh, to the iPhone. You can see AV Foundation is right here. Now, if you didn't set the SDK, you wouldn't see this because it would be pointing to a different folder. So uh, if you can't find it, make sure that you do have that 2.2 selected. But essentially, you just select AV Foundation Framework. You hit Add. Another window pops up. You hit Add again. And now you can see under your frameworks that the AV Foundation Framework is going to be compiled in your application. Uh, at this point, you can start using it. So how do you use it? Uh, well, that's a whole different story. And for that, I'm going to open up some of these examples that we've got here. And uh, I do have the online example, which we can kind of uh, go through uh, afterwards. But I thought I'd put together a more fun example for this webcast. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the Yip Yips, but they're the two aliens from Sesame Street that uh, they always went Yip 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 and uh, explored a bunch of stuff and chickens. And, and uh, I've got it set as, as my ringtone. So uh, I created a, a little project to just play a few sounds uh, that I, I pulled out of a, uh, an MP3. <clears throat> I'm going to walk you through this, this project. Um, now, essentially, you know, the AV Foundation framework doesn't really have any UI components uh, to it. There, there, are, uh, there are a few, uh, a few pieces that you can set up to actually display uh, players and whatnot. Uh, for example, the media player framework. Uh, essentially, AV Foundation is, is sort of designed to run as a, uh, uh, a, an unseen process. So all of your UI components are going to be built in UI Kit, which uh, we're not covering UI Kit in this, uh, in this talk. But if we, uh, if we build this, I'm just going to show you real quick. We really have a, a very limited UI here. The, the, the focus of this talk wasn't really to talk about how to build your little navigation uh, screens and whatnot. And in fact, you know what I'm going to do here? I think I'm sure some of you are already noticing that the resolution is probably way too high for this call. So I'm going to shrink the resolution down a bit for everyone. And that should be a lot easier for you to see. But we don't really have much of a UI at this point. You can see it's just a navigation bar, essentially, and a play button. So I, I'm not going to get into how to, how to create those. But what we will get into here is, um, is the actual code behind this. And for that, what I've done is I, I've created, you've got an app delegate. Your application to delegate essentially gets called when your application starts. And you can see that we're just kind of creating our own little window and our own little view controller. And the view controller that I've created for this project is called AV Meter View Controller. Uh, we're going to show you how to do a couple things. We're going to show you how to play a sound, how to mix some sounds. And we're also going to show you how to do something real neat that AV Foundation allows you to do, which is to, to meter, to, to tell what the output levels of the sounds are. And, and you can do some real neat tricks with that. So this is our, our view controller right here. And you can see we just got a couple real basic objects. Um, the most common object that you're going to use when you're playing sound uh, through the AV Foundation framework is AV Audio Player. And think about the AV Audio Player uh, class as essentially uh, you know, one channel in, in a sound mixing board. Uh, I've got two sounds here that we're going to play in the demo. And uh, so I, I want them to play at the same time. So I'm going to create two separate AV audio player objects. Uh, if you remember the old Celestial framework from the jailbreak days, it's kind of like uh, an AV controller object, essentially. Um, so we've, we've got one for a sound we're going to call yip, one for a sound we're going to call nope. And then I've got an actual view class that we're going to get into in a little bit. Uh, so what's inside this class? Well, let's, let's take a look here. Uh, in order to get a sound put together, uh, the first thing you need to do, of course, is to include 
DAV Foundation prototypes if you haven't done so already. And then after that, you can pretty much take this um, uh, this class that we just introduced you to, the AV Audio Player class, and, and you can uh, allocate it and initialize it uh, with a what's called a file URL. And uh, a file URL is, is uh, encapsulated inside an, an NS URL class. Essentially, an NS URL class is sort of a Cocoa class that represents a URL. Only because the sound file is actually sitting uh, on your <coughs> uh, in, inside your iPhone application, sitting on disk, uh, you create a file URL. Uh, and so what we do is we call AV Audio Player Alloc, uh, just like we do with any other new object. Uh, and then we, we initialize it, uh, and we initialize it with a URL. And if you've ever uh, coded uh, local iPhone files before, then you'll understand that essentially what you're doing is you're calling the, uh, the bundle, uh, Coco's bundle, to get the path to, uh, to your application's bundle on the iPhone. Uh, and you're referencing this file, yip.wav. Uh, this creates a, a URL object, which we're passing to init, and thus ends up initializing your AV Audio Player class or object. So you've got this object sitting here. Uh, it's a sound file. Uh, it's been initialized. Uh, we created another one called Nope, which is just essentially a different sound file. Uh, and, and you'll get to hear both of those shortly. Uh, then after that, um, the, the AV Foundation uh, objects uh, support delegates. And essentially, your delegate uh, uh, methods are, are going to be methods that get called whenever a sound finishes playing or whenever uh, an error occurs uh, while you're trying to play a sound. Uh, essentially, by by saying that delegate itself, is we're saying that we want this class to be the recipient of those messages uh, whenever whenever we get notified. So that's good. We said we said the delegate itself for both of these sounds, uh, and then prepare to play is it's not a necessary call, um, but essentially what it does is it queues up the sound uh, in the iPhone's memory. So. Uh, when you do finally get ready to play that and you want to play, <clears throat> there should be no delay or very little delay. If you don't call this prepare to play method, then essentially the first time you play it, uh, the AV Foundation will queue it up, so there may be a delay there. Not a good idea if you're if you're coding a game or something that's that's time sensitive. Um, so that's all that's really needed to initialize the sounds. Uh, now, if we if we scroll a little bit further down, uh, there's there's a lot of code here for our our own. Uh, little AV meter view. And uh, again, we'll get to that shortly. Uh, right now, we're just focusing on we want we get the sound up. Uh, we want to be able to play it. Um, really, all there is to it at this point, we scroll down to the nav button pressed method that I've set here. And essentially, this, this method gets called whenever you push that little play button um, uh, from UIKit. So uh, if <coughs> If the sound isn't already playing, essentially what we're saying here is we want to call a method to start the playback. Uh, and I've set these up on two separate timers here. I've got two different sounds, and we want one to play every every tenth of a second, and we want one to play every one second. So I've used Coco's NS timer class to essentially set two timers that just repeatedly play these sounds over and over again. And we want to play them at the same time as well, which, which this will let us do. Um, so these functions make a simple call out to the play method uh, inside this, this uh, AV object that we've created. And that's really all that's necessary to get the sound playing. You've, you've initialized the sound. Uh, and I'll scroll back up here to recap. You've initialized the sound. Uh, you've set the delegate, so you're going to get messages when it's done playing. Uh, you've told it to prepare to play. And then to play the sound, we just say play. At that point, the sounds will begin to play. Uh, when it's finished playing, uh, your delegate will receive this method call. And this is available. You can find these inside the AV Foundation prototypes. Uh, the, the audio player did finish playing method gets called whenever your sound is done playing. Uh, and that's particularly useful if you need to do any kind of cleanup or, or play a different sound or whatnot. There's also a flag that tells you if it played successfully or if, or if some kind of error occurred. Uh, so that's all there really is to playing sound. Uh, now, some of the more fun things that you can do uh, with uh, the AV Foundation framework is you can do metering. 
And I don't, I don't know if uh, any of you have grown up with, uh, you know, the old Free Tools Association uh, or some of these other groups that put together these fantastic sound and, and video demos, uh, you know, back when the Apple II was out. Um, but uh, the, one of the things that I always loved was the ability to put together like a VU meter. So while you're playing sounds, you can, you can actually see, uh, you know, a visualization of, of the sound output. Apple calls that metering. Uh, and uh, essentially what you have to do uh, is tell <coughs> you tell your, your audio objects that you want to enable metering. And then you can go and read the output levels yourself. And there's a, a standard output level, and then there's a peak output level. And you can easily translate that into uh, you know, a little VU meter graphic or, or what have you. Uh, so you can see right here, for example, when you push stop, we're setting yip.metering enabled to no. To turn that on, essentially, all you have to do is set it to yes. And so we'll take a look at this AV meter class that we've set up. And there's a little bit of graphics uh, work in here. We're not going to really get into that. But if you want to see how this works, it's, uh, it's not too difficult. Um, but when you create the class, essentially what we're doing is we've created two, uh, two AV audio player pointer objects here. And we're, we're assigning those through a property uh, down here as what we want to display as the left and the right channels on our output. Uh, now, since we've got two sounds playing, I've decided to assign the left channel to one sound and the right channel to another sound. Uh, in the demo that we've got online, we're playing a stereo sample. And so there's actually a left channel and a right channel. And I'll show you how to assign those. Um, but uh, essentially what we're doing is we create this AV meter view object here. And uh, we're going to say, OK, left and right. Uh, is equal to these sounds. We're, we're just assigning a pointer to these sounds from, from our view controller class. And then this, this class is essentially responsible for reading uh, the metered data uh, from those sounds. Um, so you can see here when you call the start updating method that I've written, uh, it turns on metering. And this is one call you're going to need to do is, is set metering enabled to yes. It's just a property. Uh, once it's turned on, at that point, you can create, uh, you can do this a number of different ways. Uh, you can create a timer to read the power uh, levels. Uh, what I've done here is I've combined a timer with the draw rect uh, method. And draw rect essentially gets called whenever the view needs to render itself. And so whenever you need to update uh, the, the view on the screen, the, the AV meters that you're drawing, essentially, this method gets called in your view class. And this goes. This is what's responsible for going and reading the meters. It looks a little bit complex, so I'll walk you through it real quick. <coughs> uh, essentially, each um, each uh, AV object that you're working with has got a property called number of channels. If it's a stereo sample, you're going to have two channels. Uh, if it's a mono sample, you'll only have one. I've got a little safeguard here, obviously. If you don't have any channels, something's severely wrong. So. Um, but you, you can read this to, to figure out uh, you know, whether you're a mono sample, stereo sample, whatnot. Uh, after that, uh, reading the meter values is, is pretty simple. Uh, there, there are two primary um, uh, properties uh, that you can call uh, to, or, or methods that you can call to get the power for the channel. And what I'm doing here is I'm essentially running through a very small uh, loop to read the meter values. Uh, I've got two channels. I'm choosing which sample I want to read the channel from. If I'm reading the left channel or channel 0, then I want to read from my first sound sample. Uh, if I'm reading the right channel, then I read the second sample. Uh, then I call the, um, the update meters method. And what the update meters method does is it essentially tells the audio object to make sure that the power levels are, are being properly reported. Uh, so after you call that, uh, essentially all you need to do is call two methods here. One is uh, peak power for channel. And then you can tell it channel 0 or channel 1 if you want to get the left channel or the right channel out of a stereo track. So you call peak power for channel. Uh, that returns a floating point. Uh, and then you can call average power for channel, which is, is the actual sound level, the, the current exact sound level that's coming out of the sound. So peak essentially is um, you know, your peaks. And then average is, is what's coming out right now. Uh, both of these return a, uh, a floating point value. And from what I've seen, these values, the decibel ranges range usually, I, I believe, from minus 100 
uh, up to zero. Uh, I've done a little bit of fuzzy math here uh, just to kind of level that out, and I'm sure it's, uh, there are probably many better ways to do it for you sound geeks out there. Um, but essentially, you, you get this value back, and you can use that to figure out where you want to draw these, uh, these little VU meters at. <clears throat> so once you've got that information, um, what I'm doing here is just a, a little bit of, of ugly math to, uh, you know, to, to render the meters, uh, to draw the graphics on the screen. Uh, I create uh, a, little, a little rectangle here uh, that, that is, is essentially setting up where I'm drawing these power images. And, uh, and then I update it, call a timer to start the whole process over again. Uh, so let me show you what it does uh, in case you're confused by now, which is entirely possible. Uh, so I'm going to build this. This opens up the project. And again, we've got, just got a real simple UI here. <coughs> let me turn the sound up, make sure you guys can hear that. But when you, play, when you hit play, essentially, you, you hear that it's playing two samples at the same time. And the two samples are just yip and, and note. They're just a couple sound bites I, I clipped from this, uh, this wave uh, file. But you can see on the left, our little sample that we were playing, and I'll, I'll hit play and mute it. The, the sample that we were playing every tenth of a second, of course, is getting played ten times as, as often as the sample on the right. Uh, now, the AV Foundation framework takes care of all the, um, the mixing. It takes care of all the uh, scheduling for the sounds. It, it's really nice. You, you don't have to sit there and essentially put together a multi-track. All you do is you tell each sound individually to play, and it gets mixed and outputted. Um, so that's, that's really the basics of, of how this works. And fortunately, AV Foundation is a very simple framework uh, in that there's, there's not a lot of added complexity. Uh, the most complex thing, as you can see, is kind of understanding how metering works uh, and getting that data out, and then the, the graphics work that's involved in just drawing the, uh, the images on the screen. Um, so uh, let, me, let me switch back here. I'm going to try and get back to my conference here. I guess I need to exit that. And uh, Catherine, uh, while I'm getting this set up here, if you um, if you wanted to maybe field some questions, it, it's a, a pretty simple framework. But I, I have a feeling most of the questions will will help to um, uh, you know really kind of get get the point home on how this works. Okay. All right. Let me see. Um, a cup. So one person was asking if there was any way to synchronize sounds. Uh, you can synchronize them. They're, they're two separate objects, <coughs> and so you have to call play at the same time, essentially, on both of them. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't believe that AV Foundation has got any mechanism for things like transactions and whatnot. There may be a way to do that uh, with Coco, but if you're calling play on both of them at the same time, they're, they're going to be relatively synchronized. I wouldn't use this framework if you had absolute critical timing issues, just because the, it's, like I said, it's a very simple framework. Uh, so you know this, that scheduling doesn't appear to be there, at least now. Uh, but it could be in the future. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, as long as you're calling these, these play methods at the same time, or one right after the other, um, for as far as your average game or, or something like that, you're, you're going to end up hearing them at the same time. OK. Well, yeah, we're getting a lot of questions coming in. Here's one um, that um, Mike asked earlier and just asked again, does anyone know the limit of, on the number of sounds prepared to play and concurrent playing streams? I'm not entirely sure if there's a limit. Um, <clears throat> I would think that, that there would be some upper limit, but I, I haven't tested that. You're, you're probably going to be up s somewhere, you know, 16, 32. Uh, concurrent sounds, um, but that that's a good question. Uh, we should definitely look into that. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, mm -hmm. my uh, my whole session online seems to have frozen up, so I'm just uh -oh. feel well. Concerned. Let me take back the control from you, and and then um, I'll pass it over to you again. Sure. Okay. Okay. So, oh, wrong computer. <laughs> I, I've got the little spinning pinwheel of gay fun here, so I don't think it's going to go anywhere. Okay. I might have to reboot, but I can continue to stay on the phone now and, and just answer any questions you've got. 
All right, so I'm going to take it back to me, and that might uh, free you up. Or are you still there? Yep. Okay. So um, let me see. Here's here's the next question. Uh, can you reuse the same object with different sounds? Call the Annette again with a different URL. Uh, you can. Uh, you can reinitialize it. The um, <clears throat> the best thing to do if you're going to play them at the same time, of course, is to have separate objects. Um, but there, there's no reason uh, that you can reinitialize it. You could also free it and then recreate it. Uh, it depends really on the needs of, of your application. How critical is it to have those objects queued up uh, and ready to play? Okay, uh, if you're just playing, you know, two or three different sounds depending on, uh, you know, email dings and things like that, then there, there should be uh, no reason you can reinitialize it. Okay. And then um, let me pull these out. Sorry, I was listening to you talk and I wasn't uh, pulling these out. And so Brian wants to know what is the best encoding for sound in the iPhone iPhone platform. You know, it's interesting. The the system sound. Uh, uh, not framework, but the system sound component uh, to the iPhone previously was very limited in what you could play. There were only a few different uh, types of codecs that it supported. The, the AV Foundation framework seems to be a lot more open. Uh, it will play, you know, pretty much any MP3, any WAV file, AIFF. I've thrown a bunch of different uh, sound formats at it, and it, it hasn't choked yet. Um, so I, I think, you know, in part the answer is whatever is easiest for you. Uh, in terms of what's, what's local and native to the iPhone, uh, you know, depending on, on your space constraints and whatnot, of course, you know, any kind of uncompressed sound is obviously going to process just a little bit faster because it doesn't have to go through, uh, you know, the, the audio codec or the audio decoding process. Uh, or at least as much of one. Um, but you know, there, there doesn't seem to be a real standard um, that I've seen out there. Um, most, most applications I've seen use either WAVE uh, or AMR, if it's a uh, uh, voice, uh, you know, like a, a news uh, broadcast, something like that, uh, is commonly in an AMR, which is sort of a voice codec. Um, but you know, really, it's, uh, as, long as, um, as long as you're comfortable with the format, AV Foundation seems to be much more open than the other frameworks in terms of what it'll support. OK, good. And so that answers the question of whether MP3 can be played. You said yes. And here's a question. How difficult is it to adjust your sample code to support something like IDRAM, four sounds at once? Forgive me if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. I drum. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I drum. Can't read it since I've already crashed, but uh, I drum. I think it is. <laughs> I drum. Yeah, I mean, if you need to play multiple sounds together, it's you know, it's pretty easy to do. The the best way to do it if you if you've got uh, like a drum machine application or something like that is to just create an array. Uh, you know, if you start thinking in terms of each of these um, AV objects being a track in a in a multi player uh, or a multi-track mixer. Uh, you know, you'd create eight tracks, for example, by just creating an, an array of eight of these audio objects. Uh, and then from there, you can initialize them with whatever, uh, uh, you know, whatever sounds that you want. Uh, you know, like I said, playing them at the same time, uh, you know, there's there, the threading uh, that actually controls this, the run loop and everything, is all handled internally by the framework. So, uh, you know, making that call it's non-blocking. Uh, if, if you had eight play statements, one right after the other, I think the delay between all eight would be very, uh, very negligible. OK. And then John is asking, how does the power for channel reading relate to what the volume of the device is set to? Uh, you know, it, it doesn't seem to affect it. Uh, these, these seem to be related more to output levels uh, than they do um, actual uh, volume levels on the device. Uh, so if you wanted to you know, tailor that to whatever the output level of the phone was, you'd need to find a way essentially to read that volume level. Uh, I'm not sure if memory serves. I think you can only do that through, through the, uh, the jailbreak APIs. I don't think Apple's provided a way to do that. OK, and, and that goes back to a question that people were tossing around earlier. Um, someone was asking if the ST SDK was available for PC, and others said uh, no, it isn't. But are there other options that people can use to develop apps on the PC for the iPhone? Uh, sure. Well, there's 
of course, there there are two different camps, and if you haven't <coughs> been familiar with lately the uh, the politics surrounding the App Store, there is of course the officially sanctioned App Store uh, development channels. And in order to, if you ever want to distribute on the App Store, you need to use Apple's uh, Xcode, Apple's SDK. Uh, for one thing, just for the the mere fact that it's the only thing that will uh, sign an application with the certificates that Apple gives you. Now that is designed specifically for Mac. Uh, newer versions, I believe, only run on Intel Macs. At the same time, there are a lot of um, uh, third-party hacks out there that can get uh, Mac OS running on a regular desktop PC. Um, there's a um, there's a distribution called Hackintosh that's pretty pretty well known out there, and uh, the the OS X86 project essentially uh, is just a set of hack drivers. That allow you, you know, if you own a, le a legal copy of OS X, uh, you can make some changes to the operating system that gets installed, so that it'll run on pretty much any any decent Intel hardware. Uh, and at that point, of course, you could run the SDK on that. Um, the the other approach is if you're not too worried about uh, distributing in the App Store, uh, the open source community has sort of owned the market in terms of application development since 2007. And the SDK came uh, into, or the, the Apple App Store and the SDK sort of came onto the scene in 08 as kind of almost a, a copycat of, of the open source community. And what, what we've done is, is uh, put together a, a free compiler, an open source compiler known as the Toolchain. We've built a, um, a very similar uh, SDK of our own, essentially based on the, the low-level frameworks that are on the iPhone. And so that's what one of my other books is about, iPhone Open Application Development. Uh, is it, it documents all of the private APIs uh, that are on the device. And many of those APIs are, are restricted from the SDK. But if, you, if you're not concerned about distributing in the App Store, the, the open source tool chain uh, essentially runs on anything. It'll run on Linux. It'll run on, uh, I believe there's a Windows port. Uh, you, as long as you can compile it, uh, you're, you're not locked into one particular operating system. And of course, the nice thing about that is, is you know, you can use a lot more of these these private APIs. Um, but it's really all according to what you want to do. And most people want to write for for the App Store. Uh, there's obviously a financial incentive, and if you're going to do that, you you have to play by Apple's rules. Okay, great. Now we have a lot of questions coming in about your about sound, so. I want to try to get to all of these. Um, Mirko is asking, what about generating sounds? How hard is it to generate and play a sound with a given frequency for a given time? Right. And um, when you're talking about doing uh, actual computer-generated sound and sort of creating your own, uh, your own sound output, uh, AV Foundation really isn't, isn't meant for that. It's not designed for that. To get into that kind of sound, you, you probably want to take a look at the Audio Toolbox framework. And uh, we can do another webcast on that, Catherine, if you like. The Audio Toolbox framework allows you to feed bits directly into a sound buffer. Uh, I use this framework for my Nintendo emulator, uh, NES app, which is only available uh, through Cydia. Um, but uh, you know, the emulating the Nintendo hardware, essentially, uh, I ran into sort of similar, the same issue. Uh, and that really is that you can't generate sound with AV Foundation. You can only play pre-recorded sounds. <clears throat> and so since the Nintendo hardware uh, rendered its own sound, obviously, uh, in the form of, of actual bits, uh, what I did was take advantage of the Audio Toolbox framework to, um, uh, to play uh, those bits into a, a series of sound buffers that would wind up making its way to the speaker. So that, that's another uh, another webcast we can talk about doing, Catherine. That, that'd be probably a much more time-consuming and advanced webcast. Uh, if you're interested today in learning how to do that, I would probably pick up one of those books. Right. OK, great. Well, we'll see if people uh, give us some feedback and ask for that, because you know I'd love to have you do webcasts. Um, let's see what else we have. Um, Michael's asking, and I'm not sure I understand this, maybe you do, can you use this object to control the volume? Uh, yes, you can, and that's one thing I, I forgot to show you guys. Um, one thing you can do is there is a, a volume property that you can set. And if you're, if you're going to be mixing sounds and whatnot, uh, in fact, I might be able to bring that up here. My, my desktop finally came back to life. 
Oh, good, good. Let me, well, let me uh, make you, oh gosh, wrong computer. Let me make you the uh, presenter again. Let's give it a try. And uh, while you're doing that, uh, people are asking if this webcast will be downloadable. Yes, we're recording it, and we'll make it available afterwards. Hopefully in just a day, we have to convert it. And so I'll send everyone a link to the recording as soon as it's available. And um, Jonathan, they're also asking if your source code is going to be available. Uh, yes, the, the source code is available right now. <coughs> um, if you go to uh, Jarski.com, and let me uh, let me reduce my resolution here. Okay. And I'll I'll try and walk you through if you wanted to download that. Great. My massive 1920 by 1200 res is probably giving people a headache. <laughs> well, okay. it's, it's, this is much better. Okay, so here we go. Uh, this is my website, and doing a quick search. If you scroll down to um, November 30th. Uh, there is a link right here for a free excerpt, uh, and that brings up a PDF that is uh, essentially a small snippet from, from my book, uh, iPhone SDK Application Development. And this runs through some source code samples that explains the audio uh, player framework, or the audio foundation framework, the audio player objects, uh, talks about delegates and how to meter, a lot of the stuff that we covered here. Uh, there is also a URL um, somewhere in here directly to the code example um, right here. So that's jarski.com slash avmeter.zip. Now that example just plays a stereo soundtrack that I downloaded from a stock uh, music site. It uh, doesn't play the Sesame Street yips, so if you want to do that, you're going to have to get your own sounds. But uh, <coughs> getting back to, uh, to volume and how that works. Uh, I've got up here the prototypes, uh, and I'll, I'll try to expand this a little bit here. One sec. That's still a little bit hard to read, Jonathan. Can you uh, bring the type? There we go. Okay. How's that? That's, uh, that's better. Okay. Um, so this is the, um, the, the actual prototype uh, for the AV audio player object. And again, the AV audio player kind of represents one track. Uh, in your multi-track, <clears throat> you can see here that there's a property for volume. Uh, by default, uh, you know that volume is at 100%. Um, so if if you want to play that at, at any other volume, you can set it to any value from zero to one. Uh, and uh, I can pop up my little demo here. Uh, let's let's go with the AV meter demo that's available online this time. and get the SDK for the simulator. Uh, if you were to uh, want to adjust that volume, uh, let's say right here is where we initialize the player. Uh, you could say player.volume equals 0.5, which is you know, essentially 50%. Uh, and that'll adjust the volume of just that one track. Um, so you know, if you want to set another track to some other volume, you can do that. Uh, and this is essentially what's what you're going to see when you run this demo here. It's, it's very similar to the other demo we just did, only it plays uh, a stereo track. I'm sure you probably got all kinds of feedback from that, so I'll stop now. Um, but uh, yeah, what you're seeing here, I, I turn the sound off, and, and you've got a left channel and a right channel. Uh, this is actually a, a good example of how a stereo track would work. Uh, you're not looking at two different samples. And I'll show you the source code even that goes along with this. This is a, 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 I'm glad someone brought this question up, so i run through this real quick. Um, if you uh, take a look at the, the AV meter view class that we discussed before, and again, this is just a custom class uh, that I threw together. But now you're talking about uh, grabbing both channels. And you can see we change it up a little bit. Uh, we've got a little loop that goes from zero to the number of channels, which will be either one or two. And what we're doing here is we're, we're calling the um, average and peak power for the channel. But instead of just saying channel zero, we're actually saying channel zero or channel one. Uh, and we're getting the level for that particular channel. And then down here, if we've only got one channel, 
uh, then we're, we're essentially making the right channel to be equal to whatever came out of the left channel. Uh, so that's good if you're playing a mono sample, uh, something to that effect. Um, now, if you, if you adjust the device's volume, um, you know, we can take a look here while we're in here uh, and see uh, just whether or not that actually affects the, um, the output. Uh, I don't think it will, but we can, let's say, set that to 20%. And we'll hit play here. And it looks like the levels are the same as they were before. So the, the output levels don't seem to be really affected by either the volume of the sample or, or likely not either, even the volume of the device. Um, so, you know, if, if there's, I don't believe there's a way to, to grab that in the SDK. So you're, if you're going to put together AV meters, uh, you know, chances are you're, you're going to be stuck with the output level of the sample. Okay, and, and I think uh, Carlos is asking, and tell me if you just answered this and don't laugh at me because I don't know. When you mix sounds, can each of them have their own volume level, and are these adjustable dynamically while the sound is playing? Uh, you can adjust them per sample, um, <clears throat> and I believe they do apply at the time that you set it. Um, there's no way, however, to know exactly where in your sample it's playing. So, uh, well, actually, no, I take that back. That's wrong. Uh, let, me, let me rephrase that. When you play a sample, it's non-blocking. So you don't get a notification until after the sample plays. If you wanted to set up a timer to find out what the current time in the sample was, you can do that. Uh, and that would allow you to adjust the volume to wherever you wanted it to. But that's something you essentially have to, to roll your own uh, if you want to do that. In other words, your, your method call to play doesn't just sit there and wait for it to finish playing. So, uh, and this is the other piece I was just going to touch on, actually. The current time property here allows you to, to set or read the current time of the sample. And that's floating point. Um, so if you set up your own timer, for example, to trigger every, every one second, you could read what the current time playing in that sample is. And if you wanted to adjust the volume at that point, you could. I do not know at this point whether it would update in real time or not, but that, that's something worth experimenting with. OK. And Ian was asking, what, what is the time interval that the peak meter value covers? And can you specify the interval to get peaks? And what about getting the lows as well? Right. Um, well, the only two um, uh, the only two methods that are there, and I'll, I'll show them to you right here, is uh, is peak and, and average. Uh, there there's no method to currently get uh, you know any other different power levels like lows and whatnot. What I've done essentially is I get the current levels, <coughs> and then I scale them down uh, with a timer. So every tenth of a second or so. I'm essentially dropping the levels of my VU meter. And unless those levels uh, from, from these two method calls, unless those levels exceed uh, you know, my decay rate, essentially, uh, they just continue to fall. Uh, so if you've got something with a beat in it, uh, you know, it'll give you the level at that current real time, <coughs> the average level. Um, but that, that will continue to decay in my code because I'm constantly subtracting you know, x, x number of decibels from it. That's something you can either roll your own or you can, if, if you take that decay uh, out and just rely on, on the power levels reported by these, uh, these methods, uh, they'll, sort of, they'll be a little more choppier, but they'll probably be you know, a little more accurate. So depending on what kind of application you're trying to put together. Uh, in terms of you know how often they're they're updated, well they get updated whenever you call the update method, but I I don't know what time period they actually cover. When when they say average and peak, I believe it it means for you know it's it's obviously within that that given time, but it, I don't think it's in other words I don't think it's within the past five seconds or ten seconds, but I think when they say average and peak, uh, you know you're you're still talking about pulling, uh, you know, potentially, you know, a thousand or, or, or more samples uh, out of that, that time period that you called the update, even if it's just for a half of a second. Uh, you know, you, if you think about <coughs> a CD quality wave, which is going to be 44 kilohertz, well, it's, you know, 44,000 data points per second. And so that needs to be aggregated, uh, you know, somehow. And I, I think what they've done is they've taken uh, all of those data points to establish, you know, the peak and the average. Um, but I, 
in terms of whether that's one second, a half a second, a quarter of a second, I really don't know. Unfortunately, the docs don't seem to be uh, you know, very descriptive in terms of what they do. And that, that's kind of part of why I, I started off saying this, this framework's really not complete yet. Uh, you, you get the impression by looking at, at the prototypes and, and just the name of the framework, and it tells you it's, it's obviously going to support video at some point. Uh, I'm uh, certainly excited to see what, what comes out of it in the future, but this is, uh, it, it's kind of unlike Apple to just uh, release something that's kind of half, half complete. Uh, and what's there is very good, which is why I think they did release it. Uh, but there's unfortunately not a whole lot of information uh, about the low-level mechanics of it yet. Okay. One other, uh, one other oh. piece here that I just wanted to introduce you to as well is number of loops. Uh, and everything we've played so far has just played once, and then it finishes. Uh, if you'd like your sound to loop uh, X number of times, you can set this property. And uh, this property will, you know, of course, loop it. So we could set player.number of loops equals 5. The sample will essentially play five, or it'll loop five times. And then after that fifth time, your uh, sample did finish playing method will, will get invoked. OK, excellent. Now let's see. Um, there are a couple questions just about the uh, AV audio player. And I, let me see, people are typing fast. One person is asking, can it be uh, can it help to record speech and process for live voice recognition? Yes or there no don't question. appear to be any recording uh, methods or any recording okay. functionality in, in the AV uh, Foundation framework yet. Okay. Not to say that they won't add them in the future. But the, this is AV audio player. It's not a, uh, a recording object. Uh, in order to record, uh, most people are still using the audio toolbox, which will record on a byte-by-byte -byte basis uh, directly from, from the microphone. And it will sort of stream that into either an audio file or into, um, you know, into memory if you, if you were going to process it somehow. Um, so th this isn't really meant for recording. But I do have an example uh, of recording in, in both the SDK book and the open book. Uh, I unfortunately don't have an example of that anywhere online. Uh, but if you've got either of the books, um, the uh, Making Some Noise or Making a Racket chapter uh, also does cover uh, basic recording as well. OK. And Michael's asking a question. I'm not sure I understand it. He, uh, but you will, of course. He says, can you read the iPod streams instead of creating your own streams? And he further clarified that by saying, asking if there's access to the iPod streams, that is, if your app starts while the iPod is playing. Uh, yeah, I think what he's asking is whether or not I can record the music that the iPod is playing. And the oh, so again, you can't record. Can well, not, not with this, but even with the audio toolbox, um, you know, Apple obviously has got you know, copyright interests that they want to protect. Uh, they're not going to let you, uh, you know, record anything that comes out of iTunes. Uh, you know, they're even on the desktop. Uh, they've taken a number of measures to try and prevent you from being able to copy uh, you know, your music. Um, you can record microphone, um, but in terms of you know recording anything that's playing through some other channel on the phone, without some some pretty uh, low-level hacks that you wouldn't be able to do, accomplish in the SDK. Without that, you there's no way you'd be able to to take advantage of what's playing uh, in another application. Unless, okay. of course, you, you had the iPod plugged in the speakers and you could hear it through the microphone or something. OK, so he's, he said not record, but just to read the sounds or mix with them uh, to make your own EQ equalizer. Right. Well, um, the, the open platform, uh, in other words, the jailbreak platform, uh, mm -hmm. does have a framework. Uh, that, that will allow you to tap into the iTunes music uh, and, and read the, that data. Uh, unfortunately, that's not available in the SDK. Uh, they won't let you interface with iTunes on any level. And, and you know, obviously, like I said, you've got some copyright issues to, to deal with there. So you know, be, you're not able to read uh, <coughs> iTunes uh, music. You're not able to read any files outside of your sandbox, at least without some hacks. And again, you know, at that point, you're talking about really forfeiting uh, your application uh, from the App Store. Uh, okay. You 
you don't really have access to any levels outside of just the samples that you're playing either. So even if your application was playing sound through some other facility, unless you've got a pointer to those objects, uh, you, there's, there's no real way to, to tell what those output levels are. Essentially what you're doing is you're playing into a uh, sort of an, an early stage mixer on the iPhone, uh, and, uh, and that mixer is kind of controlling uh, by creating a, a composite output stream that goes to your speakers. So once it gets in there, there's really no way to, to fish it out. Okay. All right. And let me see. I think we're, we've just about answered all the questions. Uh, oh, I don't know if this is appropriate, but uh, one person was asking what the warning was on the player NF URL. He says he gets that, too. It flashes oh, on your screen. <laughs> Yeah, and I, you know, I double checked with a bunch of other developers because I hate compiler warnings too. And essentially, what this is, it's some kind of typing bug uh, with um, with the way that they set up uh, the AV Audio Player framework. The the error field right here, when when you go to initialize um, <coughs> an AV Audio Player object, you can pass an NS error object or an NS error pointer. And essentially that pointer should get set to a pointer of an error if an error occurs. Uh, in, in all other examples of doing this, uh, historically, uh, you are supposed to pass that reference to the error. Uh, and that does work with just about every other Cocoa, uh, Cocoa class. Uh, for some reason, when you create it uh, this way, uh, you get this compiler warning. and um, I've asked around, uh, I've double checked, and the, the syntax is correct. Uh, it, it's for some reason just spitting out that warning. So I, I think what it's come down to is, is just some, some typing issue um, yeah, with, with the way that they've set up that class. OK, good. And then John is asking, at the start, you mentioned iPhone OS 2.2 as a required target OS. What if it's not present on the device? Can you check the OS version first? and then use a different sound API? Right. Well, if it's not on the device, <coughs> then you're, you're not going to be able to link to it. So what you're going to end up with is a binary that won't even start because it can't link to this framework. You can probably, if you really wanted to, use DL Open and, and some of the more low-level uh, dynamic linking functions to test for that framework. Um, but if you're going to go to that trouble, chances are it's going to be easier to just code everything with audio toolbox or with the, the system sounds. Because uh, okay. at that point now you're talking about you know, actually going and, and trying to link to libraries. and you, There's no, no real need to duplicate your code. So what I would do, if, if you really want to sell for the 2.0 and 2.1 platform, is to just code this in audio toolbox. And the, the way to do that is you know, you, you're basically reading these files on a bit-by-bit -bit level and writing your own program to sort of feed that data into a sound buffer. It's, it's more complex, but you know, once you write your first version of it, you can reuse that code pretty much anywhere you want to. What happens today if you sell an application like this, like in order to even compile this application, you've got to have it set for 2.2. If I try and change it to, uh, <coughs> to 2.0 and then recompile it, it should fail with a bunch of errors. Uh, if you compile it with a 2.2 SDK and then release it on the iTunes, essentially what will happen is the app will say requires 2.2 upgrade. Uh, and if someone running 2.0 or 2.1 tries to download it uh, or purchase it, it will say, uh, it, it will give you a very ambiguous error, which is, is kind of surprising. Instead of saying that the user needs to upgrade to 2.2, it will say something like this application is not compatible with your firmware. Uh, and I made that mistake with one of my other projects, um, <coughs> inadvertently releasing a 2.2 uh, build. And I had people emailing me saying, what does this mean? Why is it not compatible with my phone? Uh, really, whatever, essentially the problem is, you know, whatever SDK you build with is, is going to be uh, you know, the, the minimum requirement uh, for the operating system. So I just keep that in mind. And um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're real concerned about 2.2, uh, you know, if you want it to be 2.0 or 2.1 compatible, there are there are a couple other frameworks out there that you can use. And the, fortunately, that Audio Toolbox framework is very well documented because it exists on the Mac OS X desktop as well. So you should be able to find a lot of example code out there. Um, you know, that you've got my code from the book. You've also got all of Apple's documentation online. 
Great. And there's one final question, and then I think our time's just about up. And I really appreciate you answering all these, Jonathan. Um, they were asking about uh, using URLs that point to files on the net versus in the sandbox. Is it? Can you do that? Right. And I don't know why <coughs> why it doesn't work. I I'm not sure if it's an intentional thing, uh, you know, relative to copyright. You can theoretically assign a URL, and I would encourage everyone who's curious about this to try it. Uh, instead of doing file URL with path, you could do NS URL, you know, URL with string. And, uh, you know, as an example here, I'll get rid of that. I could do NS URL or URL with string, blah, blah, slash, blah, dot, or blah, dot, wave. That is syntactically correct, but for some reason, when the sound actually goes to play, it, it doesn't play. It, it's silent, and I, it's entirely possible that I may have just, you know, not had a valid WAV file. Uh, but I tried several times, several different URLs, and it just it was silent after that. Uh, I even tried. There's a uh, there's a way to set the URL uh, using uh, an NS data class, and so I tried fetching the data. Uh, using <coughs> NS data using a URL, and it still wouldn't play at that point. Uh, I think part of the problem uh, may have been that um, you, you have to, you know, one thing is you have to wait to make sure that that URL loads. Um, so th that's something to try. Uh, I don't know if they've changed that or fixed it with 2.2.1, two dot two dot but when I tried it with 2.2, .2, .2, I could not make it work, even after waiting for the file to load. Um, Give it a try. Uh, they're they're always making improvements to the SDK, and you know there are there's a pretty lengthy list of bugs right now. Uh, you know, for for many different frameworks, it's entirely possible that I did it wrong, uh, but it's also possible that it might have just been a bug that they've cleared up. Uh, but the, theoretically, it's it's all there. The logic is there. You should be able to load uh, a URL from a web page uh, and play it using this this mechanism. Great. Well, Jonathan, I think we're just about out of time, and you covered a lot, and I'm getting very positive comments from people thanking you for answering all these questions. And um, before we go, I wanted to tell people, sorry, sales pitch again, that you can save $200 on Jonathan's iPhone forensics uh, class that he's teaching, and you can find complete information about that at training.oreilly.com. There's a code that you can use. Marcy just posted it. Also, um, Jonathan's newest book, the um, iPhone SDK Application Development, it's been out of stock on Amazon. It'll be back in stock next week. You can also order it from us. And we have a code that you can use for your book order, which is uh, forecast, or what am I saying? Yeah, for, and then C-A-S-T. And that will give you 40% um, off your book order from O'Reilly. So. And that works on the PDFs, too. You just can't use it in the UK. So um, you know, you're welcome to use either of those. Oh, it's temporarily in stock. Good. <laughs> yeah, it's selling fast. So I just want to say thank you very much, Jonathan. And everyone else, thank you for joining us. And I will send you a link to the um, recording as soon as it's available. Thank you, Catherine. All right. We'll do it again sometime. Excellent. Okay, let me just copy.